Greetings, friends, and welcome back to Worship with the Longmeadow Congregational Church, United Church of Christ in Auburn, New Hampshire. If you're joining with me for the first time, my name is Reverend Ruth Gallet. I'm the pastor of the Longmeadow Church, and I welcome you here to our church community. We are currently worshiping in person on Sundays at 930, as well as on Zoom at 11 o'clock, and of course here every Sunday. I also am... Um, coming to you on Wednesday mornings with a special message for the children of our church, and I hope that you will join us then as well. I am recording this in advance. Um, I'm actually recording this on Election Day, and so as we go into our time of prayer, I am just asking you to join with me in praying for our entire country in this time of great division. Whatever the results of the election today will not end the division. And so I just invite you to join with me as we work together to become as united as we can to always see each other and speak with each other as fellow siblings, as children of God, whether we agree or disagree, and perhaps most especially when we disagree. Help us to remember to have these conversations with each other in love. Remembering what Jesus said, that which you do to the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you do to me. And so let us speak to each other as if we were speaking to Jesus. And that doesn't mean we can't disagree. Out of our disagreement and our discussions comes growth for both of us, when we listen to each other, when we respect each other, when we treat each other with love, then we can find the consensus, the place where we can come together and grow. And so I invite you to join with me as we move forward together as a nation. And so my friends, today as we begin our worship as we do each week with prayer. Um, each week I raise up a particular ministry within our own church and this week I invite you to join with me in praying for our long partnership with Church World Service. You've heard me speak about them before. Uh, we do kits for them, we do the Blankets Plus for them, and it's something that our small church can join with other churches around the country and really make an impact. This week I was reading about Church World Service's response after the two major hurricane events in the southeast. And I just wanted to share with you um, what has happened with the donations that we have been able to give. By participating in this ministry regularly, we ensure that Church World Service can respond promptly when there is a disaster or an emergency, either here in the U.S. or around the world. Church World Service has recently learned, excuse me, I have recently learned that as of October 18, CWS has distributed 5,824 emergency cleanup buckets, 10,000 310 hygiene kits, 7,280 blankets, 1,800 menstrual hygiene kits, 650 school kits, and 72 welcome backpacks to partners in Florida and North Carolina, a value of more than $697,000, and continue to ship more supplies as impacted communities become accessible. Church World Service will also be involved in the long-term recovery, long recovery to help meet the needs of those impacted in the months and years to come. In the wake of back-to-back -back hurricanes with entire communities battered and broken, our support through Church World Service can be a lifeline the families need to survive and rebuild. And so I just want to thank you for your ongoing support of this ministry and we will be uh, assembling our school kits after the holidays we decided there's just too much going on and it can wait till after the holiday uh, to do that um, because Church World Service sends a truck up to New Hampshire every May. So as long as we have them done by May, we're, we're good. And all of the supplies have already been collected over this past summer. 
And so this is just an ongoing ministry, and we are so pleased to be part of such a wonderful effort. And as I said, it, by doing it regularly each year, it allows them to respond immediately and to provide all of this need that I just read to you. So thank you so much for your participation in that ministry. And just I ask that you can join us in continuing to pray for them and their efforts. And now, my friends, will you join with me as we begin our time of worship with prayer? Living God, we offer you praise in your presence. We offer you praise in your presence. We give you thanks for life in this community. Some come seeking, others come assured. Some have questions, others simply want company. Whatever our reasons for gathering, may they all lead us to an encounter with you, your grace and your way. Infuse us with your power forged in love so that we might be encouraged and respond as bearers of your light on earth. We thank you for this community of faith and for how we can work together, how we can be a family even and especially when we disagree, that we can continue to come together and have discussions that are meaningful and helpful and growth producing. We also give you thanks for the many years of partnership we have enjoyed with Church World Service and how our donations combine with others to provide immediate and meaningful response and aid in times of emergency and hardships as they did recently after the hurricanes in the Southeast. Bless us and Church World Service as we continue in this partnership. We also give you thanks for our siblings in Christ in churches throughout New Hampshire. And this week we raise up and ask a special blessing on St. Matthew's United Methodist Church and Rock Church Sandown, Trinity United Church in Seabrook, Assumption Greek Orthodox Church, Summersworth, First Parish UCC, Summersworth, South Danbury Christian Church, Southampton, Baptist Church and South Newbury Union Church UCC. We give you thanks for the ministries of these congregations and ask that you continue to bless them, that they may be your light in the world. Lord, we have placed be you have placed before us your wonderful world with its blessings and its difficulties. You have called us to be peacemakers and people who will work for you, offering our lives and our gifts in your service. But we sometimes hold back from trusting in these gifts you have given us. We wonder if they will be enough to make a difference. And we become caught up in the trap of believing that only the largest gifts have any worth. Forgive us when we slide so easily into our fears of inadequacy. Each of us has been blessed and each of us is called to be a blessing. There are no small and insignificant gifts for God to bless and use. Free us from our fears of not enough and help us to joyfully place our hopes, dreams, and lives in your care. Lord, on this week, we hold up to you all of your beloved children across our country and around the world that is moving forward in hope, but is still so divided. And we pray that you will mend our hearts and keep us always mindful that we are siblings and that we are all your children. Help us to see the divine, that of you, that image of God that is in each person we speak with, and have us speak with that respect and love. We pray for all those who are ill, awaiting test results, or receiving treatments, as we also pray for all those who have died and those who are grieving. As we have lifted up names and situations today, seeking your healing mercies and comforting power, Help us to feel those same mercies and comfort active in our lives, reminding us that your love is poured out on us so that we may serve. Strengthen and encourage us as we raise our hearts to you now in silence. To live as God's people of abundance, while not giving in to the pull of our culture, we are going to need the power of your Holy Spirit. And so we lift our hearts in the name of the Father who sustains us, the Son who instructs us, and the Spirit who leads us as we join together in the prayer you taught us. Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Today's scripture continues in the Gospel of Mark. We are reading Mark 12, verses 38 to 44 today, as Jesus continues with his teaching. Again, it is Mark 12, 38 to 44. As he taught, he said, Beware the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have the best seats in the synagogue and places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for the sake of appearance say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury, for all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. This, my friends, is the Word of God. I don't know about you, but every time I hear this particular text, my first thought is, ah, here comes a stewardship sermon. How about you? Did any of you think that as I was reading the text? It wouldn't be surprising, after all. This text always shows up in the lectionary in the autumn season when we typically begin to plan for our annual stewardship program. And we have often heard the story of the widow in Mark's gospel as a story of sacrificial giving. It is a story about generosity. It is an image of one who gave all that she had. It would be no surprise that you might be sitting there expecting me to offer my annual stewardship sermon, but I'm not going to do that today. <laughs> Don't worry, we will get to that soon, but not today. Today I want you to notice something else. What I want you to notice is Jesus noticing. Because I think this text is more about noticing and being noticed than it is about giving. Do you ever wonder why some things or some people seem invisible or at least easy to miss? Why don't we see that open jar of jam or that open bottle of ketchup in the refrigerator even when it's right there in front of us so that we go and open up another bottle or jar until we have numerous open bottles and jars in our fridge? Or how can we walk right by someone we know and not see them until they say our name? A few years ago, I was doing a funeral at a local funeral home for, and before the service began, I was standing right beside a member of my congregation and I never even noticed it was him until he spoke and I recognized his voice. And then just a couple of weeks ago, a young man from our congregation who I baptized many years ago, but I had not seen for a while, came to worship and because he had recently joined the Marines, obviously had a very close cropped haircut and I was looking at him thinking, I know that guy, I, I know him. Do I know him? And went through the entire service wondering who he was until someone said his name. And then I realized, oh my gosh, I mean, I've known him all his life and I didn't recognize him because of one relatively small change in his appearance. Now, I, I recognize that, you know, after going through a few years of everybody wearing masks and children, young children growing into adults during that time. And my fa the fact is, 
I wear glasses and I don't see very well uh, without them. The reality is I still miss things, even, even without those excuses, even with those excuses. I still just sort of miss things and, and don't see people or things at times. I'm just oblivious to it. Jesus and his followers have finally reached their destination in Jerusalem. And they are at the great temple where Jesus is being questioned and tested by religious leaders. Now, last week we heard about one scribe whom Jesus acknowledged had questioned him fairly. It was a, a legitimate, fair question to ask, and apparently truly seeking wisdom and guidance. However, Jesus had also been dealing with others who clearly had less honest motivations. He was subjected to questioning about his authority to teach at all, to heal, to share the good news. They questioned him about the paying of taxes, trying to trick him into speaking against the government. They questioned him about the resurrection to trap him into speaking against the Holy Scriptures. I don't know about you, but I would be pretty tired after all that questioning, especially when you understand the malevolence behind the questions. And so Jesus sits down and watches what is going on at the temple. He sits and he watches the people putting their money into the treasury, and he notices the crowds as they come and go. He notices the wealthy as they offer their riches to the temple with a great show. And he notices the one most people would never notice, like the poor widow who came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. This treasury to which they were all contributing was partly for the upkeep of the temple, but also partly to provide for the poor. This woman, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on, Jesus tells us. She who was poor gave everything she had to help of the poor. I don't think I need to point out the irony in this situation, but Jesus needed to. He noticed what no one else did, and he pointed her out to his disciples. To them, she was probably inconsequential, overlooked, unobserved. Nevertheless, in Jesus's eyes, she was the most noticeable person that day. Would I have noticed her? with my obvious limitations in this area, would you have noticed her? The fact is, each human being, from the poorest to the richest, richest, deserves our notice, deserves our respect, regardless of whether they give out of their abundance or out of their poverty, or if they give anything at all. Every human being deserves to be noticed, to be seen. For every human being is born with the image of God and is the beloved of God. Jesus says, look at her, notice her, see her. Not just for what she does, but for who she is. Decades ago, I was working in a booth at Faneuil Hall Marketplace in Boston, uh, which is a very, it's a tourist kind of area um, with lots of little boutique shops. It, I will admit it wasn't my favorite job, but it paid the bills at that time and that was what's important. It's sort of a high-end shopping district filled with little boutique shops and carts. Um, catering to tourists and people with enough excess income to spend $4 on a single cookie or $40 on a candle. But being in the city, it was also frequented by people who were homeless, seeking a warm place to spend the day. There was one man who I saw with some frequency, who I believe every time I saw him, honestly, was drunk and was talking to himself. He was dirty and frequently the odor of sweat and alcohol was overpowering when he walked by my booth. I also found him honestly a bit frightening and so being a young woman at the time I basically did all I could to 
ignore him, not catch his eye, and keep my distance. One night I was working the closing shift and he wandered by about nine o'clock at night and that particular night he was quite agitated. He was yelling and swearing at the top of his voice and I turned away. About 15 minutes later I saw security leading the man out the door and into the rainy night and as he passed under a lamp he happened to turn in my direction and we made eye contact for a split second possibly for the first time ever and I saw tears streaming down his face and in a flash I saw what all I saw was a frightened little boy and a voice spoke into my heart as clearly as any I had ever heard that this man that I had taken no notice of and gone out of my way, in fact, to not notice was once someone's beloved baby boy. I don't know what circumstances had brought him to this situation. I have no idea what I could have done to change the situation, but in that moment, of seeing him and of seeing tears falling down his cheeks, I was broken. With the realization that at the very least, he deserved to be noticed. He deserved to be seen for who tr he truly was, a beloved child of God. I pray that God will never allow me to forget his face or the feeling of true brokenness my lack of noticing someone brought me to. For it is in such moments of brokenness that our faith is kindled and grows. Opening our eyes and ears to simply notice is the foundation of discipleship. As Adele Alberg Calhoun put it in Christianity Today, Jesus would spend nights in prayer because he noticed his need of time with his father. Jesus hung out with people because he noticed they were sheep without a shepherd. Jesus noticed. Jesus saw the rock on which he would build his church and the disciple who denied him three times. Jesus heard faith in the plea of a desperate father. I believe. Help my unbelief. Jesus noticed the unnoticeable, my friends, and calls us to do the same. Jesus saw what was good and lovable in each person, including those whom others would avoid, and he called them friend. Jesus noticed, and he calls us to do the same. The Bible was not written to encourage us to look at good and great people of the world and what they are doing. The Bible was written to point us toward God, to help us look to God. And so today I'm not going to tell you to be like that widow and give the last of what you have. Today I'm going to tell you to look at Jesus and encourage you to be like Jesus, to notice the widow, to notice the people whom others would overlook and turn away. Notice the cycle in which the widow is caught never being able to break out of the place society has assigned to her. Notice the drunk man and the cycle of addiction in which he is trapped without seeing a way out. Notice the person who is sitting right next to you at the funeral. Notice the young man in the back of the sanctuary you haven't seen in years. Huh. Maybe this is a stewardship story after all not just a story about how we steward our money. Because good financial stewardship is not an end unto itself. It is meant to be just the start of changing us, of changing our hearts so that in the name of Jesus, we, we might work to change the world. Maybe this is a story of how we steward our whole lives. And it all starts with noticing, 
with seeing, noticing the overlooked, noticing the hidden, noticing the belovedness in everyone around you. And so despite face masks or my need for glasses or children changing into adults, I will pledge to notice better. And I invite you to work to notice with me that we might be the loving eyes of God who sees the worth in every single person, every beloved child of God. And to God be the glory. I thank you all, my friends, for joining me here today. And in this broken world, as we move forward, when the needs of the world compel you, may the blessings of God assure you. May the abundance of God inspire you, and may the goodness of God embolden you to resist the mentality of scarcity and to embrace a life of generosity, compassion, mutual love, and noticing. Until we meet again, my friends, go in peace and return in joy. Thank you. Goodbye.